What are you doing down there, Turbo? Trying to save yourself from the sun? It is pretty toasty today. It's not hot, it's just the sun. It's really intense and bright. Hey, what's up, garden friends? Jeff here, everybody doing? You're doing well. I'm great. Look at, check out my packages. So Poro, it doesn't really have the same hit, does it? I have a bunch of plants rolling in, in the mail. It's that time of year, right? Things are coming in. And typically every year, each plant unboxing gets its own video. I don't really feel like doing that this year. And since mostly everything's coming in all in the same week, I figured when they show up, I'll just open them up and have a look at them, put it all into one video and just have a plant unboxing extravaganza. Has it sound like a good time? I hope so. Something very exciting inside of this one. I cannot wait to open this package up. Starters have Holland Bulb Farms down there on the ground and Brian's Botanicals right here. Let's get started with the bulbs. Tomorrow, so several minutes from now for y'all, have a big box coming in from Plant Delights. I'm really excited to open that one up. There's some pretty cool stuff in here too. For starters, have some gladiolas, which, okay, I'm gonna go from least exciting to most exciting, obviously, right? It's a YouTube video. Two different bags of those in here. Now, I think gladiolas are pretty awesome. Talked about it in a recent video. They're just a uh, nostalgia plant for me. If you don't know what a gladiola is, gladiolus, it's a bulb you throw in the ground. They have some big strappy leaves, kind of like an iris, and they put up a really big spike of trumpet-shaped flowers that are held tightly together along that spike. They come in all different colors. Right here, I just have the super pack of mixed glads, and then over here I grabbed, what are these, 25 of the parrot mixture, which have more of a ruffled petal, an outer petal. Very pretty. I'm gonna be planting them all together. I'll just blend them all together, put them in the sun. Like I said, for me, that's a nostalgia thing, so maybe not all that exciting to everybody else. My mom used to plant a lot of gladiolas. I don't know if I have the sun for them out here, but I'm going to give them a try. These are perennials here. There are hardy glads, which are supposed to be more cold hardy. I don't understand gladiola cold hardiness, to be honest. Growing up, when this was a zone five, they came back every year, and the couple of times I have had them out here years ago before the trees were as big and there was more sun out here, they always came back for me. It wasn't until things started to get more shady that they stopped coming back. I have a spot back somewhere else. You'll see it in a vlog when I plant them up where I think they'll get enough sun. So I don't know. Time will tell. It's exciting. I'm excited about gladiolas. Canis Stuttgart. I try them every year and every year I get a little bit frustrated with them. Last year I ordered these rhizomes from several different companies to see who actually sent the biggest ones and Holland Bulb Farms was the company that came through. Pretty big rhizomes. There's three of them in here. You can see that one about like that. For a canna, they aren't huge, right? I'm gonna just pinch them through the plastic so you can see them. Not that big, but considering the sizes I was getting from other places, these are monstrous size rhizomes. The ones that I was getting from everybody else were like just these puny little chunks of root. You could hardly even call them a rhizome. Probably should have ordered two of those, but one is fine. The Stuttgart, if you don't know, it's a canna. They have beautiful variegated leaves on them. They're one that can be a little bit more difficult to grow because they can be particular about their lighting. Afternoon sun can scorch them, yet it's a canna, so it needs the sun, right? You see where I'm going with this, where things get complicated. For the most part, if you give them lots and lots of morning sun and then shade more into later in the afternoon, they will be fine. Do you see him down there? Having himself a little temper tantrum. He's pouting because he can't get in the pool. Such a baby. Invoice also came with the planting guide, all that fun stuff. This isn't really going to be a review of any of the companies. I'll link them down below, the companies. I'm not going to link every single plant individually. That would take an eternity. But, you know, you can go to the website and type in the name that you're interested in. Because I've already done so many unboxing videos from all three of these companies over the years. I don't think really you need to go into all that detail. I can already tell you off the bat, packaging, as far as these three companies go, Holland Bulb Farm. I'd give it a, I don't know, a solid B plus, A minus, because they're just bulbs. Like, what do they need to do? I think this is pretty good. I don't really know what else they could do, so let's bump it up to a full-blown A. The botanicals haven't opened it yet, but if it's like it usually is, I will probably be frustrated with it. It's a lot of plastic or tape. Very messy, and plant delights, which hasn't even gotten here yet. I love their packaging. That'll be a solid A. There you go. There's your unboxing review before we've even gotten through it. You'll hear more from me if there is more that we need to talk about. Okay, so what's left in here? See that? They're little, but they're very exciting. <laughs> These little corms. These are Banrai Red Curcumas. It's a type of ginger, a torch ginger. They have a nice colorful flower. I'm sure I will have it up here on the screen for you. 
There are, I believe, six in here. One, two, three. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, the price on them was pretty good. They had a sale. I think they're sold out right now. It's a plant, a root you can get from a lot of places. It's not an uncommon one. These I have wanted to plant up on the hill for quite a long time. And since the price is really good, I thought, well, why not give that a shot this year? The nice thing about having them up on the hill, instead of looking down on them, be looking straight at them. When you're looking straight at them, you're going to see those flowers better because the torch ginger, the curcumas in here, the flowers on them tend to be hidden. That's why they're also sometimes called a hidden cone ginger. A lot of the ginger names can be broad and used for different types of gingers. That's not an uncommon name that you'll hear for them. But by having them up on the hill, be looking into them instead of down at them, so we'll be able to see those flowers better. I'm excited about those. I have several curcumas in the garage in the grow space still that have yet to come out, but they're all up and doing their thing for the year. These are typically a zone eight. There's some kirks that you can overwinter into zone seven, just need to mulch them really heavily. I don't plan on attempting that with these. They're just too expensive, even though I got a good deal on them. It just seems so much easier to just lift them, clean them off and store them for the winter and replant them than to mulch them and do all that stuff and then maybe not even have them return, right? I don't want to mess with that. I'm a 7A. There are a few that you can try here that I've had some success with. Like I said, I just don't, I don't know. I don't want to mess with it. I'd rather just lift them up and store them. It is unlikely when we have lows during the winter time that <laughs> kill off a little gem magnolia and laurel hedges that a curcuma, well, at least the Benry Red would survive the winter. You never know. Maybe I'll leave half. Who knows? Time will tell. Next. Very excited about this one. This is from Brian's Botanicals. There's only a couple of plants in here, but they're both ones that I really like. And one of them is a new introduction that might be a bit of a game changer for the industry. We will see. Also, do you see this? Is it, is it happening to you too? It's gonna be in my head for the rest of the day. Brian's Botanicals always has a pretty good selection of plants. You know, Brian Williams, he has hybridized and come up with lots of cultivars of all different types of cannas, calocasias, alocasias. This year should be seeing a lot of the pharaoh's masks on the market at your local nurseries, the redemptions. That's just to name a few. They're a good place to get plants that you haven't tried before. The thing I like about them is that they are in 6B Kentucky. I was a little surprised they didn't get bumped up to a zone 7. Maybe they did and they just aren't going with it. I'm kind of the same way. I'm 7A, but I still feel like I live in 6B because the winters here are pretty terrible. So there's some relatability when it comes to what is actually going to be cold hardy. Probably wondering like, Jeff, why are you even talking about this? It becomes relevant in a moment, I promise. Oh, what? There's three plants. I don't remember ordering three plants. I thought I only ordered two. Okay, well, one of these might be a surprise or one of these plants I probably ordered two of. They left a little note in here explaining why there's an extra plant and I am certainly okay with it. These three, I should open them, shouldn't I? You don't want to just look at them through the paper, do you? Probably not. Paper off of here. Oh, this is a nice sized plant. This looks really good. I used to spend so much time trying to meticulously remove the tape from these containers, but I have learned it's so much easier to just go through with the box cutter and cut it out. We zoomed in way too far there. Sometimes you end up with some tape left on the sides of the container, but that's okay, I don't care. Nice bunch of rice holes on top there. This is Calocasia Electric Blue Gecko Improved. It's not there yet, right? It needs more time. It's still a baby. Don't judge it just yet. It's been in a package that makes it harder to see it. Oh yeah, look at that. At least with my sunglasses on, I don't know what you all are seeing, but do you see? that bluish kind of a deep indigo sheen that's inside of that leaf. The electric blue gecko, one of my favorite colocasias because it's so, I don't know what the word, maybe majestic. Is that too dramatic? I don't think so. Oh, but the lettuce is out here because the tortoise, he's out here somewhere and that's, it's for him. That's why there's just a random head of lettuce just sitting on the patio. Get in nice and close. Hopefully you can see it. Like an oil spill, which isn't, okay, that's not <laughs> something that we're supposed to say looks pretty. You know what I'm talking about? That iridescent sheen. So if your car, you ever had an old car like 
I have many of them. They leak sometimes. It's just a beautiful collar case. Yeah. Those dark leaves with that blue iridescent sheen to them, a nice reddish purple stem that goes down. And this is the improved, so it's just supposed to be more vigorous. I'm excited to try this out. I haven't tried the improved one yet. I can already say it looks pretty good. I've gotten some in the mail before that were pretty puny. Already off to a good start. It's got a little bit of wonk to it. That's okay. It was in a package. My main concern anytime I'm getting an elf ear or a banana in the mail is more about the roots than what I'm seeing above ground. because so everything goes back to how is it going to transplant? What's that transition going to be like moving from the container to the ground? I'm seeing a nice sturdy plant here. There's not any wiggle in there which means that this should transplant really well. So that little wonk there, it doesn't even matter. Colocasias just don't usually look great after they've been shipped. That's, you can see what's going on here. A little bit sad. That's okay, it's gonna perk up. The black coral is another Colocasia that I try and plant every year. And that's only because I can't usually get a hold of the blue geckos. It's not one I ever see at the nursery, so it's something I have to order through Brian's Botanical. You know, I like this one so much, I really should. I should just start digging this up and storing it. I don't know why I don't. I have so many colocasias in the grow space right now. There's no reason that I treat these as annuals. It doesn't make sense. They're one of my favorites. Okay, these two, are you ready? I'm almost tempted to wait until after the Plant Delights order comes in because I might be more excited about these than anything that's coming in the Plant Delight. No, there's some coming in the Plant Delights order that are pretty awesome too. Have a little peek. Can you see what, you'd see it? You don't even, I'll, sorry, I'll just pop it open. Okay, you ready for it? You ready? Look at it, isn't it? Trust me, it's gonna be awesome. Some growing to do, nothing wrong with that. That's the same thing I was saying with the electric blue gecko. Also, it's only May. It's May 1st, the day that I'm filming this. So I wouldn't expect these to be very big to begin with. Pharaoh's Dream Cadocasia. So the Pharaoh's Mask might be something y'all are familiar with. Has a kind of a reverse cupped leaf on it. Dark green foliage with a heavy, thick, very three-dimensional veining that goes through it. An alien looking plant. Swept the market as just an all-around awesome Cadocasia to grow. They've gone mass production as of this year. I think it somewhat started last year, but you'll be seeing them at the nurseries. Pharaoh's Mask, it's an awesome one, been growing for several years. This is Pharaoh's Dream. Pharaoh's Dream, instead of having that reverse cupped dark leaf like the Pharaoh's Mask does, it has just a normal cupped leaf like you would see on a coffee cups or a teacup or the bikini teeny. You can see from looking at the picture here, we're gonna to have to reference the picture over the plant because the plant is just tiny, tiny little baby. More of the typical green color on the inside with a white variegation that has a creamy yellow to the outside of the variegation. The variegation all hangs out in the veining with a pink dot in the middle. They hold these leaves upright, kind of like a bikini teeny or a coffee cup. It's not that reverse look. This is all from what I've seen from looking at the pictures on their website, right? I haven't seen it in person. Talk about an awesome tropical looking leaf. Giving me heavy vibes of the uh, what is it, Zebra Stripe, Gloriosum, Philodendron Gloriosum. Wouldn't it be nice to be able to grow that in a climate that gets cold? It gets better. There's more. This gets even cooler. Go ahead and show you the back of the hang tag if you were wondering. Too close. Back it up. There we go. Likes the sunny spot, prefers afternoon shade, keeps the soil moist, prefers a high humidity, fertilized once a month. USDA hardiness zone 7 to 10. 7 to 10. That's pretty interesting. On their website with all the descriptions for the plant, this has been surviving their winters in zone 6B. Talking about how this has been an extremely tough and resilient, cold, hardy colocasia for them down in Kentucky. Maybe rivaling the hardiness of the pink china, which would be interesting. Actually, the pink china, I've never done well with it. The bikini teenies come back flawlessly. Pink china, I think it's because the ones I get, they always just have a virus or something. I will have talked about this in the video prior to this about the polar green. That's, I don't need to go into all that. The point, though, is that anecdotally for a lot of people, Pink China has been hardy into zone 5, 5B, 5 6A, somewhere in there, for a lot of people. As long as you keep them nice and healthy and you don't get one that has the viruses in it. That has nothing to do with this plant. I'm not concerned about viruses with this one. I'm talking about a whole different colocasia. If this colocasia with foliage like that is hardy into zone 6, reliably hardy into zone 6, it's going to take years before we really can say you know, as a whole, because it's done well for them, doesn't mean it's going to do well for other people in zone six, just like I was talking about with the pink china and the bikini teens, all those things. That holds true, even if it is a zone 7A hardy, I would say that this is probably one of the most tropical looking of the hardy colocasias that you could get for your garden. If you want something that's going to look like it's something straight out of the Indonesian jungle, 
I would say get one of these. Isn't it fun? Don't you love it? It has some growing to do. That's just the nature of things. On that note, I had mentioned that there was a plant in here that I did not remember ordering. What the note was about in here. Hi, Jeffrey. The Call of Casey of Pharaoh's dreams were small, so I sent two. Wasn't that nice of them? That is something I very much appreciate because they weren't cheap. These are a hundred bucks. I did, it was, so $50 because they sent two because they're pretty small. They feel nice and sturdy though. So I'm not really all that concerned about the size. This is a lot like what you see with the, uh, what is it? The Pharaoh's masks when they come back in the winter, the bikini teenies and the pink chinas when they do come up, you usually have this kind of spindly, awkward swirling motion going to them before they take off. And that's just gonna be a matter of weeks when the heat rolls in. I imagine these are going to just go insane in the garden. They're pretty awesome. I have to say, I think that this is the plant I have been the most excited about for 2024 is trying out the Pharaoh's dream. Just wouldn't that be a dream come true for something with leaves like this to just come back year after year. I'll be doing minimal things to overwinter them. I'm going to plant them near my banana clump so that they will benefit from the mulching that goes on with the bananas. But I'm a 6B, 7A. If it's been hardy for them, it should be hardy for me. I don't know. Kentucky is a smidge further south than where I live, so they get those cold snaps that we get up here too, but usually, you know, maybe 20% more mild than when it is up here. So we had that cold patch last January and it was like minus 12 for over a week straight. It was maybe like minus eight or zero for them. Hard to say. I don't know. I don't keep track of their weather, but you get the point. They're further south, but still a 6B. 7a location just like i am can't wait to watch them grow and see what happens with them i'm getting the uh, faux vibe for the gloriosum and they're also kind of making me think of the waikikis which is one that i love and they have the cup shape that you get with the bikini teeny or coffee cups or tea cups or any of those other you know the cupped foliage which is my favorite shaped foliage with a colocasia that they have everything that i love and cold hardy that's so cool. I need to get these watered and moved into the shade. They've been in a box. I shouldn't have them sitting out in the sun like this right now. And then tomorrow, whenever the plant delights order gets here, we'll come back out and get that opened up. Assuming it's not raining. It's supposed to rain a lot this afternoon tomorrow. I don't know. We'll pick up with another box of plants. Oh, that's an extreme close up. You're looking good today, Turbo. A little bit of cloud cover, a natural filter, making things look nice. The plant delights is here. If, I mean, it's, you know that it's right there. Showed up later in the day yesterday. So I decided to wait, it's been two days. I don't think any of y'all care about that, but I think it's something that you need to mention when you're opening plants, if they sat in the box for an extra day. Also <laughs> saw in one of the cameras when this was delivered, the delivery person got about, I'd say eight feet from the patio and just poof, chucked the box and it landed on its side. and. And so who know, I don't know I don't know how these things are going to be looking in here, but know that it won't be fair to say that it's plant delights fault if they're not looking too hot. I doubt that's going to be an issue anyways. They're very good with how they package their plants and uh, that should protect them from the occasional box being tossed and whatnot. It's never really a great thing when somebody takes a package full of plants and throws it and it ends up landing on its side. Not really sure why they did that. Only had to go a few more steps, but hey, here we are. Turbo, you are way too close for comfort. I have the box cutter in my hand. That's not safe, Turbo. Hey, okay, now for the fun part where I open the box and go, oh, what did I do? Some fun stuff down in here. Planting guide, invoice, some very nice blue paper. I like the blue paper. That's good. I need a cheat sheet. It's been a minute, so I don't fully remember everything that's in here. See, look how everything got smushed and tossed around. That's not normal. Everything always shows up looking so good from them, but again, this was thrown, and who knows what else it had been through before it got here. Not ideal, but not the fault of Plant Delights either. My favorite things about ordering from Plant Delights, other than the fact that they just have a really fun selection of plants, is this right there. You just, just pull the whole thing up. It's so easy, so nifty. Oh, those are cute. Those are so stinking cute. Oh yeah, I already know what that is. What about you? Oh yeah, those are fun too. And then pretty sure these are a redundancy in my ordering. Yep, I'm gonna have plenty of those this year. Let's go ahead, it's misting. So I'm probably gonna be cutting in and out an awful lot because it's going from mist to rain and mist to rain. I'm just gonna try and work through it. So I'm a little bit closer to the house. There's not really an overhang here, but it helps a little bit. I normally go through and pull everything individually and talk about them while I'm unwrapping them. I'm not going to do that. Just I'll start with the first plant so you can see how they're packaged. If that's something you're curious about. They're in these carriers that hold three plants 
H hey baby start of the show huh have a tab in the corner that you push back and then in the back side there's a tab that you have to remove to loosen up and that will get these pieces turbo you're not you're really not helping bud and that's to get these tabs out and that way the plants just lift right out real simple and then plastic is rubber banded on all my rubber bands that i have in this house are all from plant delights i'm gonna unpack everything and go through it all and talk about all the fun stuff oh they look good one of them's a little wonky that's kind of to be expected considering you know the box is being tossed around and it's a colocasia leucocasia we'll go from back to front here in the back there's a lot of redundancy going on I have two of the colocasia redemptions and a leucocasia gigantia the Thai giant so if you watched last weekend's video just like the video prior to this one i believe in that video i picked up the same plants i got a couple of Thai giants couple of the redemptions last year when i was placing these orders i didn't know if places would actually be able to fulfill the orders with the redemption so the places i saw them for sale i said okay well i'll just get two it was just a redundancy thing so that i would you know have a couple of them to work with and it turns out they're extremely abundant so now i have five that's too many i'll be giving some away i do not need them all in this backyard but it's just good to have them don't need to say much more about them they're packaged well Nice, sturdy plants. They look pretty good. The Thai giant that's back there, you can see it. It's all flopped over. Its carrier that it was in was smashed. And I'm just going to assume that that's from the box being thrown onto the patio. And who knows what else happened to it along the way. They aren't the best shippers. So that's pretty much what I expected from them. It's the only reason like, I'm not going hard to give you all a great close-up of it. Because look, you know, look at it. Okay, and then in the next row, these are some plants that I teased at in a video not all that long ago, sometime in the last couple of months, when I was talking about the cast iron plants and said that I have some cool ones coming in the mail. Well, here are two of them. There's some more I'd like to order, but I thought this would be a good starting off point. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm talking about this over here, right here. This plant is sitting right behind me. Just the regular cast iron plant, talked about them, growing them outdoors and having them as house plants. Just overall, really excellent plants. Very sturdy and green. They're just, they're nice. Very nice plants, lovely plants. This is just your regular green Elatior. Over here, these are the Elatiors, but just so much more fun. I think what I had actually said in that video was that even though I was talking about growing this as a house plant and also outdoors, but I had said that this would be going outdoors for me because there are more fun varieties that I would prefer to try inside. And that's where this one right here comes in. Look at that leaf, isn't it fun? It kind of looks like blight, but it's not, it's variegation. This is, I'm not, the name, I'm going to ruin the name, but it has a common trade name that will come off the tongue much better. Espedistra Hanado Raku? Is that good? Well, the tag's right there. You can read it. I believe that the more common trade name for this one is called Skyline. It's been a minute since I read up on it, to be honest. It's not one of the hardier varieties. You saw right there on the tag, I think they said 8B, yeah. 8B and up. So not a chance this is going to survive the winter here if that's an 8B and up. So this is one that I want to try as a houseplant. It has that beautiful foliage that looks like it's being splattered with light. It doesn't look like it, it's just, it has light just shimmering all over it, especially, you know, if there's a little breeze and moving in the, not that it's going to move in a breeze indoors, not that Espedish is really moving in the breeze very much, period. They tend to have a very strong, sturdy leaf. You get it. It's just a beautiful plant. This is the one that I wanted to grow out in a container and keep indoors as a house plant. This next one will be going in the ground with the regular Aspidish, or not along with it, but next to it. This one has some more going on with it. This is the snow cap. The snow cap, it's a 7A and up. I'm 7A ish, 6B, now 7A. The snow cap is very similar to just your regular cast iron plant, except the tips of the foliage are kissed in white <laughs> that was a very dramatic way to say it wasn't it you can sort of see the variegation that's going to be on this new leaf that's emerging here and from down there it's a variegated plant not going to grow as quickly as your regular varieties which don't necessarily grow all that fast to begin with there is another espedisher that's very common that has that white variegation on the tip that's the uh, asashi asahi i don't know but you can read it up on Plant Delight's website. They talk about it. That's a great one with the variegation, but the variegation doesn't persist year round, or not always year round. 
whereas the snow cap is supposed to show it off more quickly and hold on to it year round. These get 30 inches high, which is a nice big size for an Espedistra in a more cold climate. Typically, like it's 7A, 6B, 7A, you just get the Eladiors and that's about it. Variegation persisting year round is fantastic. Doesn't mean a lot when you live someplace like I do where we have these drops where we typically go below zero for a couple of days out of the winter time and that's gonna knock them down to the ground. So the main thing for me is that they show their variegation more quickly. Usually you need to be pretty patient with these and get the variegation on, but look, this is just a rooted cutting, a chunk of rhizome in there, and it's got one, two, three growths on it that are going to have variegation on them. You can see some down there on that little one. So that's fantastic. Not going to have to wait a long time, and that's something where you plant them in a nice dry, shady area, and you're just gonna have this lovely green foliage with that white right on the tips of it. It's gonna be so pretty. I'm really happy about that one. Wanted one of those for a while. And back here, this is a palmetto. Sable palmetto. I believe this one's Augusta. Yeah, as in Augusta, Georgia. They're saying 7B to 10B. Sable palmetto is a great palm if you're a very patient person for a cold place. I actually have better luck overwintering sable miners and sable palmettos than I do windmill palms. And I think that it just has something to do with the windmill palms not being uh, really uh, sturdy for extreme temperature fluctuations. It could be in the 60s one day in the winter and then plummet to minus 12. That happened this year. The next day, it was just in the negative. Stay that way for 10 days, then it was back up into the 40s and 50s. Windmills, well, negative 12, they don't like that period. But I'm even talking about if you cover them up, there's just a lot of fluctuation. Things get warm inside those enclosures, whereas the sables typically, I don't have as many issues with them. Now, I don't expect a sable palmetto to do well here, but it's one that I wanted to try, and I figured it would at least be fun to grow it out in a container for several years because I like the foliage on the palmettos. They have that fun cost palmate frond on them that has a curve to it, so it's like an in-between of a pinnate frond and a fan frond, a palmate frond, that is. And it being the Augusta, that just means that maybe it's more cold hardy, I don't know. Those are things where lots of people have to grow them to really say much about it. It's being grown from seed from a plant in Augusta, Georgia that has grown very well there since I think the 1980s maybe. I'll have this up on the screen so that y'all can read it because I can't, I don't, have this stuff memorized. Read that for the exact details on it. I just love palmettos, so it's one that I thought would be a nice one to give a try. What you doing? What you doing? You think you're gonna get in here? You can't go up here, you're gonna smash the plants. Oh boy, he wants to get in that pool so bad. He's being so patient, waiting for me to stop filming so we can go swim. All right, baby, you gotta wait. Almost done here. Okay, mangave. That's not the mangave. Mangave, over here. Here it is. This one is pineapple upside down cake. This is a mangave that has your typical variegation that you get with a lot of mangaves, that lighter green in the middle with a heavy green outline on the edges, has some serration on the ends of the foliage. Why won't this go back in? There we go. Things rooted in there really well. And then it has the red speckling on the inside. These get really colorful as they grow. What drew me to this mangave in particular was that the description talked about how the more sun you get, obviously you're gonna get more variegation, but that it starts to take on a pinwheel effect. When viewed from above, there's a swirly nature to the growth habit, as long as it gets the right amount of sun. And I thought, well, that sounds really cool. Not just the variegation. The variegation on a lot of mangaves is awesome, like with the kaleidoscope. And then there's another pineapple. Is Pineapple Express. Is that another one that looks very, very similar to this one? I think that's what it's called. Be a fun potted plant. Not hardy here, 8A and up. I believe these go like, what, 16 to 20 inches or something like that. 18 high by 24 wide. Oh, great. Now I have to try and get that. Oh, went right back in. That worked out much better this time. So a good size. Probably taking a couple years to get up there in size, but that's okay. Mangaves are so fun and easy to grow. Should probably be thinking desert with mangaves, but when I see them, I usually think bromeliad just because it's the rosette shape plus the color and the more flexibility that they usually have in their foliage from, you know, the Manfreda that's in them that have more of an elastic-y nature to themselves. That wasn't the best way to describe those. More flex, which just makes me think more bromelia. This because, you know, in my head, when I think agave, I think agave, like the sturdy plant with the giant. There's one right here. We'll talk about this one right now. See, very different, but there are lots of different types of agaves, which is why there are so many fun different types of mangaves, right? This right here is one that 
I am really into and so glad that I got. It is the, it's called Grandkids. I've made, how many, we gotta get that out of there very carefully. Get in there, Perii Giant Grandkids. That's the name on it. So the cool thing about, well, just the Perii in general is that they typically are very cold hardy. They should be good into zone 5A. Now that's a dry zone 5A, right? Even though I'm zone 6B, 7A here, Agaves do not do well for me in the winter time. They always rot out if I don't put something over them to keep them dry. Main thing is that the center of them stays dry and the root zone stays dry when it's cold outside. And it's pretty easy to protect them. There have been years I've just taken like a milk crate and thrown some frost cloth around it that usually will hold water out and just drop it over the plant. That allows some light to get in. It doesn't allow things to get really hot in there because I, typically I use a fairly cheap and thin frost cloth. I should have said that when I do something of that nature so that light can get in there and airflow can happen. Not a lot, but some, but it's enough to keep the water from penetrating that whole area because you need to get out past the root zones. The main thing is that the soil drains well and they stay dry during the winter time. So what's cool about this one in particular, it's not just that it's a perii. Perii's are pretty common. They have a fun shape to them, the neat looking plants. And also it's notice the tag says 5B, I said 5A. Bump that up five degrees from what I was saying. The giant grandkids is a big perii. A lot of the more cold hardy agaves tend to be rather small. This one right here, it should say on here, 36 inches high by 42 inches wide. That's big. I know some agaves can get huge, but they don't grow here. You can't grow those this far north. This one's from a very specific region at a higher elevation. Really big size on them, that fun artichokey shape that they get. And I believe they're supposed to offset heavily. I can't remember again. That should be up on the screen for y'all to read. It's just, it's too much to memorize the details for all of them, but you get the picture. For a cold hardy plant, it's a really cool one. This with that polar green that I was talking about before, these are some plants I'm very excited to work into the garden. May grow it out for a couple of years. We will see. That should be okay at this size because like I said, it just needs to stay dry during the winter. And at this size, Keeping them dry is very easy. I would honestly, with this, when it drops below 15 outside, I'd probably just throw a pot over it. And when it warms back up, pull the pot off of it. That usually works fine for me with cacti and succulents. So maybe that's what I, I don't know. Winter's not here yet, we will see. Main thing is go someplace with a good amount of sun. Maybe some afternoon shade would be okay for it. And the swell needs to drain really well. And ideally a spot that doesn't get blasted with too much wind during the winter time. Winter time's pretty windy and can dry the plants out. Okay, let's go with these now. These are pretty neat. Uh, I don't know which ones to talk about next because the last two plants are ones that I have been waiting for and so excited about for such a long time. I guess it doesn't really matter since I'm excited about both of them. Let's just start with the ones that are right in front of everybody. This is Yucca Recorvifolia Mellow Yellow. Here's the tag. If you need, I don't know why I'm showing you all the tag, but I'm gonna put the thing up here on the screen about them. This is a variegated soft leaf yucca. The, the reason I'm excited about these is because there is a variegated Recurvifolia that I have known of for a long, long, long time called Margaritaville. And it has the nice, long, strappy, drapey foliage that's about tricolored with its variegation. There's various shades of green and yellow on the inside. I have never been able to find that plant for sale, ever. Plenty of pictures of it, have not been able to find anybody who's selling it. Recurvifolias are good in zone seven. I have a couple I keep in containers that I do move inside when it drops below zero. Plenty of people grow them in the ground, but I just prefer to keep them in the pots because it's only a few days a year that I have to move them inside. It's just easier to do that than to take care of them in the ground if they need some extra protection. I do plan on putting these in the ground someday. They're small. They need to do some growing. I haven't been able to find variegated Recurvifolias, period, for sale, ever. The mellow yellow, from what I remember from Plant Delight's post that they put up a while ago about releasing these plants, this is the first time that they've sold them. They've had them for quite a while, I think 15 or 20 years. These were sent to them for them to grow out in trial, say that they're performing better than the variegated recurvifolias typically do. Maxing out at about four feet high, pretty typical for a recurvifolia. So I think that it's one that's going to be really cool for a lot of people to grow. What's fun about a recurvifolia, outside of the variegation, just what's fun about a recurvifolia yucca is that, <laughs> yucca, that's, that's not how you say that. They stand out from what you typically see in the zone six area, because recurvifolias, this probably says seven, no, six B, 
you can really grow them into zone six. Like I said, the only reason I don't is because it's just easier to move them in so that they don't top off. They'll regrow from the roots, and even if you have some die off on the trunk, they'll respout from the trunk, but I'm trying to get a good amount of monopodial growth on them before I have to worry about anything like that. Eventually, the ones I give them containers will go in the ground as well. And actually, I have some in the ground in my front yard. I just totally I forgot about them. I don't protect them. They do fine. So eventually these will be in the ground and they look like a more tropical plant because of that variegation and because they form a trunk. The typical yuccas you grow here don't get that trunk on them. That was, I was going to get to that point earlier and I deviated into something else entirely. There are rostratas and thompsonii's and there are plenty of trunked yuccas, four zone, 6B, 7A, but I'm a wet and an erratic 6B, 7A. They just don't always do that well here. The recurvifolias are probably the best ones for my location that get a trunk on them. And they're not really spiky, not as spiky as most other yuccas anyways. The foliage has a drape on them like you see with a ponytail palm or like with a lot of dracaenas. So when you get the variegation in here, which is what I should be focusing on since it's the main point of these plants, they look so beautiful and tropical, don't they? And look at that, that just looks like a dracaena. If you hadn't seen the tag, would probably think that these were little dracaena starts, if you were looking at them from above, or maybe chlorophyte items. They do kind of look like baby spider plants right now. You get it. The whole point there is that it's a beautiful, cold hardy plant with very striking, beautiful foliage that has beautiful flowers as well. Once you've grown them for several years, they have massive flower spikes on them with the bell-shaped white danglies that hang from them that should be happening around May for most people, depending on your location. They're white and everything, but May is typically when a yucca will bloom, they're fun, they're colorful, it's very out of the ordinary, very, very, very tropical. And even if you can't get them to a trunking size, like if they you have dieback on them in the wintertime, they will grow back for you from the roots every single year and still get a foot to about 18 inches tall. Because I've had that happen with mine several times and we've had years with ice storms and some bad things, remembering my ones in the front yard. So you still have that fun grassy texture to them. I would imagine it should be the same thing with these right here, sometimes when things are variegated, they're not quite as sturdy, which is what also had me excited about these plants, is they're saying that they think that they're more sturdy or more reliable, whatever it said on the website, for a variegated recurvifolia. I've talked about recurvifolia so much on the channel over the years. They're just one of my favorites. I like the shape and everything about them. That leads me to the next one. Doesn't have the same shape. It does right now, but this is going to change. <laughs> That's going to change a lot. Also looks a lot like a spider plant, doesn't it? More of a spider plant that has its act together. It's not quite as wild and crazy looking. This is another yucca. This is an aloefolia. Get that wiped off there. So don't know why I'm doing this. It's gonna put up here on the screen. Mediopicta. The Mediopicta is a variegated aloefolia, not one that has soft tips on it like the recurvifolia. The recurvifolia will still get you, but these are pretty spiky. Variegated aloefolias. Also, very hard to come by. I don't know why, but they just are. The Mediopicta specifically is just a very difficult to come by cultivar. I've never seen it for sale. This is the first time Plant Delights is offering it. Pretty sure they mentioned on the website the difficulty and even being able to sell them propagate. This is why I'm so happy to have one here. These will go about five feet high. That's the tallest I've ever gotten an aloefolia to grow here before it gets kicked back by a bad winter and they have a very spiky, will stab your eye out type of foliage to them. Not like, you know, the recurva folias. Something to plant away from pathways, keep them pushed back, or maybe underneath windows might make some good extra protection if you're worried about people breaking into your house. These will get them. They don't form as thick of a trunk as you get on a lot of the other yuccas. These have more narrow growth on them. They'll usually hold on to a lot of their foliage, so you can have a five foot stalk of just stabby big spiky leaves going all the way up the trunks. The Mediopicta, it's variegated. That's the thing about it. Alloy folias aren't necessarily hard to come by. It's the variegation on them that's hard to come by. I don't know which type I had in the past. I think it was probably on the channel way back in the beginning, back in 2015 or 2016. I'll never find the footage of it, but I used to have three variegated yucca alifolias that were in the front of this garden bed. That was before the trees grew and there was full sun right here, this blazing sun. And those got knocked back by the ice storm, I think in like 2016 or something like that. The same one that knocked my recurvifolias down. The difference is these didn't come back. And uh, I think one of them, maybe, maybe one of the three did survive and end up moving it because 
they started to reach for the sun and they were coming out over the pathway. There wasn't as much protection anymore. The further they got from the house, it was like they were getting a lot of burnt tips on them during the winter time and they were dangerous and spiky. So they had to go. Had I known that I would never be able to replace the plant, I would have done things differently. I would have taken that out of the ground, probably chopped it, done a lot of propagation with it and just kept it containerized. I don't think that what I had was a Mediopicta. It seems unlikely since they're so hard to get a hold of. The ones that I had were just labeled as variegated Spanish dagger, which is the alloy folia. And there was no other information about them. This is you know, probably 10 years ago. Actually longer than that, I think I planted them like 2010, so 14 years ago. What was neat about them, I don't know if this is gonna hold true with the Mediopicta, but in the spring and fall, when we were having the cooler nighttime temperatures, they went from having the two-tone variegation on them, which on its own, absolutely beautiful, they would move into a three-tone variegation where they would have a pink outline on the edge of all of the leaves. I don't know if the Mediopicta is going to do that. I didn't see anything about that in the listing, so probably not. So still not the same variegated ones that I used to have if they're not going to go tricolor with the cooler temperatures. I'm just glad to have it. It's another cold hardy plant that will need to grow out in a container for a few years before I try them in the ground. This is, that's, that's very small. I don't want to put that in the ground just yet. I want to get that till it has a, I'd say, uh, uh, about a mature size. I want it to really be fully filled out with where its trunk's going to be started before it goes into the ground. But again, you get that tropical vibe with them because it's something with monopodial growth that gets Sometimes a curve to them. They're sturdy, hardy, reliable plants. Yeah, really happy about this one. Can't wait to watch it grow. I mean, that, just, that doesn't look like something you could typically grow here. And well, I mean, it technically isn't because every now and then we have winters that will kill it. And that's why it's going to stay in a container until it reaches a better size. It may actually always stay in a container because the alley folias are not easy to protect during the winter time like the recurva folias are. The recurva folias have that soft foliage on them. So you can wrap them up with some lights and some frost cloth if you need to. These, they are so stabby. Not right now because it's just a baby. It's not all that stabby right now. When these are mature, these leaves will be more straight and stiff and extremely sharp. So I have fun reaching inside of that to wrap lights in it or put frost cloth around it. It's just, it's not a fun thing to do. For me, since it's something that's more rare and hard to come by. It took them a long time to get these on the market. I may very well keep this containerized forever just to be safe. And I'm fine with that. That's not a big deal. It would be able to be outside the majority of the year, just not when we have those random days where it drops below like, I don't know. With that, I'd probably treat it like the windmills below 10 just to be safe because they're in a container, right? So they're more exposed. Otherwise, outside the majority of the year. All right, and that's it. That's everything. I say that's it. There were a fair amount of plants in this video. All some really fun and unique finds, especially for the vibe that I go for out here where I want the things that have more of a tropical appeal to them. You know, something that sets things out from what I see when I'm out walking the dog, where I'm just seeing lots of boxwoods, spruce balls, and peonies. It's something more unique and interesting. So when I'm at home, I feel like I'm somewhere else. It's nice to have that escape. And these are great plants to use for that aesthetic. Some of them house plants like the Espedistra back there and some of them not really house plants, but like 90% of the year outdoor plants and 10% of the year indoor plants. Just depends on the winters. Can't wait to get them planted up. Hopefully going to be working on that in the video that comes out after this one. So waiting on some other stuff to happen. Don't really know what's happening in this next video, but stay tuned and check it out. Maybe something fun will be going on. Comment down below what's going on in your gardens. Some fun new plants you've been trying. I was happy to do this video because I was able to talk about so many plants that are new. Polar green, new. The mellow yellow Recurvifolia, the Mediopicta Alloyfolia. It's not that often can have that many totally new plants in one video. So that's exciting. These are fun things to look out for. All right, as always, and most importantly, everybody, keep on growing. Bye-bye.